Welcome to the Rechex Podcast. Today we are with Mark Stusnap, who is the London-based Head of Fixed Income Strategy at Informa Global Markets. Welcome to the podcast. Let me just jump straight on to the first question. I think it's a burning question at the back of everybody's mind in the city or Wall Street. However you look at the markets, because there are quite a few macroeconomic headwinds on the horizon. And then each time we, we sort of hit a situation like this, everybody turns their attentions to what the central banks are going to do or not. So are we being too overly reliant on monetary policy? Um, I think the simple answer to that is yes. I'm, I'm not sure if this is a, a function of a whole generation of market participants who have never really experienced anything other than central banks easing. Um, if we go back to the financial crisis, uh, there's very, very few central banks that have participated or tried to tighten policy, certainly significantly. There's been the odd little bit like the Bank of England. Um, but market participants who have come in since then, as uh, the experience has left the market, it is not surprising that every time there is a little a wobble in the economic data, that the markets themselves seem to go into overdrive I wouldn't call it panic necessarily, but they do seem to go into some sort of overdrive in expecting central banks to come riding to the rescue. And the central banks themselves possibly back themselves into the corner, especially after their pretty aggressive reaction to the the financial crisis, the euro crisis, and I don't think anybody debates that that was needed at the time. However, since then, there doesn't seem to be a symmetrical reaction to the data and I'll pick up on US Q2 GDP uh, on for that. The final sales to domestic purchasers in US Q2 GDP was extremely strong. Uh, there was barely a market reaction to that. The same figure in the previous in Q1 was weak, much, much weaker and Everybody jumped on that and saying, oh, this must mean that the Fed has got to cut, it must cut, etc., etc. Uh, there has been better data in the lead up to the July FOMC. And in the olden days, that would probably have been enough to stop the Fed from cutting. It, it, it will not be because the markets have decided that the Fed has got to cut. The Fed itself will be worried about the market reaction if it turns around. And of course, they have the US president breathing down their necks. We're supposed to be doing monetary policy by Twitter these days. Mm -hmm. But you briefly touched on, on some of the complexities facing central bankers, but let's touch on those those, those macroeconomic headwinds that I, mm -hmm. I, I, I touched on. And then we've got Brexit. Mm -hmm. We've got the Italians having a tussle with what mm -hmm. the ECB won. Then there's the spectre of the German slowdown. Uh, if you were to choose, there's plenty to choose from. But in your view as a market commentator, how would you rate some of these, these headwinds? I mean, if, which one is, is the most wise for you? Um, the uncertainty caused by trade policy is the dominant um, downside weight to the global economy at the moment. and it is very unlikely that central banks can do much to combat that. Uh, certainly not directly. Say they, they would like to mitigate the effects, surely. Um, but the, the governments themselves have got to start understanding that in certain jurisdictions anyway, that there, there, there needs to be some fiscal help here. Uh, I know a lot of people have talked about mentioned Germany, for instance, um, and the Netherlands as having the fiscal space. I, I'm not entirely sure that those alone will be enough to, say, drag the Eurozone out of trouble. The politicians themselves are, will probably must, they've got to engage in a, in a more proactive stance to try and get rid of the political uncertainties, whether that be Brexit or, or the trade policy. Um, for the Eurozone, it is pretty incumbent on politicians to try and help the, man the, the German manufacturing industry, which is very, very reliant on exports. And of course, if trade slows down, then their exports are going to slow down. And if the German economy itself slows down, 
uh, the rest of Europe does tend to follow. Um, this will, the ECB cannot do this on its own. You know, in, in trying times like this, this has probably never been a, been a stronger case of, you know, uh, for central bank independence. So, so if I may ask you, we, we'll come to what kind of pressures there are later on in the podcast, but if I may ask you, what are the central arguments in favour of central bank independence? Uh, politicians, <laughs> simply. Yeah, I, a very good example is the UK in the 80s when uh, the then Chancellor Nigel Lawson decided to pursue an expansionary fiscal and monetary policy. Uh, and this had the desired effect of causing economic growth to to boom. Unfortunately, it also caused inflation to rise quite rapidly. Um, the economy was growing way, way above its trend growth rate. And that may sound desirable, but when it's done for a while, it, it is not desirable. And of course, UK interest rates were jacked up and there was a classic boom bust and a, quite a severe recession in the, in the UK. Um, that was a politician performing policy for the electoral cycle rather than the business cycle. Um, since the financial crisis as well, monetary policy has become far more complex and there are many, many more policy channels than there used to be. It is arguable that politicians will not necessarily understand the intricacies of policy and, and let's remember politicians tend to move quite frequently. Um, the current UK Chancellor has been in the office a couple of years. The previous one was, what, three, four years? Is that long enough to gain a deep understanding of the mechanisms of monetary policy when they're also supposed to be looking after the fiscal side of it matters as well? Um, so there is this concern that politicians will go back to the ways of just manipulating the monetary policy just to suit their electoral cycle. Uh, so the markets probably faith, place more faith in central bankers and politicians, and a politician will run a risk of placing a political premium on interest rates as well. So borrowing costs would more likely be higher than they are than they would otherwise be with an independent central bank. Uh, and the reason you don't want an economy to have too loose financial conditions, which create the unsustainable booms, which have inflation, inflationary consequences. And if governments have a history of doing this, then inflation expectations, they will rise, which in turn makes higher inflation, higher actual inflation levels more likely. And it's arguable that an independent central bank with an inflation mandate will support more stable macro policy versus the alternative of politicians with their hands on the levers. And more stable policy allows for economic agents to plan with much more certainty and is probably a growth promoter. You know, it, it, it then ties up nicely to, uh, to a question where we can conclude the podcast, which is that, you know, we see Trump having a go at the Fed on Twitter. We see lots of pressures uh, closer to home here in Europe. And of course, all around the world, there are pressures. Turkey offers a case in point. So how worried should the markets be? Because often central banks have been a cornerstone of monetary policy independence, but right now they, they ought to and rightly are feel, feeling the heat. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think the markets have to be overly concerned in, say, the UK, the Eurozone, Japan, or the US. We've clearly had some jurisdictions such as Turkey that have, and this, it looked as though some politicians in South Africa were going to try and take some independence away from the Saab. Um, so I don't think overall there is a huge threat to independence presently. Uh, this could change and one of, the, one of the issues that central banks unintendedly have created are distributional effects of quantitative easing in the main. And this is an this the argument here is that there's been an increase in financial inequality um, caused by the wealthy get richer because they tend to own the assets which have been fueled by quantitative easing. Um, 
I, I certainly think this is unintended from that behalf of central banks because I don't think anybody thought 10 years ago when they started going down this road that we would still be in a situation where we are looking at potential reopening of QE in the Eurozone and there's a possibility in the US too. The worry would be is if some seeds of some forms of populism were were sown, I mean, they probably already have been sown, um, and some politicians sort of get hold of that and start pressuring and start thinking they can win an election or a mandate on it on, to, um, to take central bank independence away. Uh, now, the counterfactual argument here is, had it not been for easier policy at the time, the impact of the Great Recession might have been uh, much worse. Um, so, yeah, I, I, again, I don't think the markets have much to worry about at the moment, but over a long period going forward, as the central banks may come under more political pressure to do something. And the problem they've got coming up as well is the asset management industry. If the, as more and more uh, sovereign debt, which is supposed to be the safe stuff, goes negative, asset managers are going to start facing potential negative income, negative yields, negative roll. And this might, when people start, if the long run scenario here is that people start getting their pension benefits cut. So either these asset managers have got to start going into the riskier end of the spectrum, that could have more distributional effects. Uh, if that starts fueling some seas of populism going forward, then I think central banks will come under a lot of the politicians will come under a lot of pressure to maybe start curtailing some of this independence. Well, that's plenty for the listeners to, to chew over. Uh, thank you very much for your time. That was Marcus Dusnap, Head of Fixed Income Strategy at Informal Global Markets. For more details on ReachX podcast, go to www.reachx.co.